An old colleague of mine died a few months ago. Back in the day, Harry had been the editor of one of the big regional newspapers. The paper is long defunct now, finished off by the rise of the internet, like so many others. A few weeks after the funeral, I got a call from Jackie, his wife. She'd been clearing out Harry's home office. In an old filing cabinet, she'd found a large envelope containing a series of interviews recorded on cassette tape. They related to stories that Harry had worked on in the 1980s. Jackie asked if I was interested in them. Now, Harry had always had a nose for a good story. The first tape I listened to was an interview with a former British intelligence officer about a bizarre secret World War II project, parts of which appear to be still classified. It's been a long time and most of the people involved are long retired or dead. Even so, I'm still bound by the Official Secrets Act, so I'm limited in what I can tell you. I'll do my best. It was late 1943 that I first became aware of the project. I was at that time assigned to the Directorate of Miscellaneous Weapons Development, a military intelligence branch. Bit of a mouthful, I know. We coordinated unconventional programs for the War Office, specifically relating to devices that might contribute to the war effort. I also liaised with the chaps from MI8, the branch that focused on communications research and technical development. In December 1943, I was asked by the head of MI8, Major General Davidson, to act as military liaison to a project they were sponsoring at Oxford. The secret academic department was led by one Professor Horace Lidkins. It was known as the Temporal Mechanics Research Group, established in early 1943, with funding coming directly from MI8. Its work had been kept hidden from public view and even obscured from most other faculty at Oxford. I was reminded by the general that the whole affair had the highest level of security classification. The general said Lidkins, Lidkins could try the patience of a saint and he wished me luck. He also sweetened the deal by gifting me two bottles of my favorite Scotch whiskey, Glenlivet. The research was well over my head, so if you want me to explain the theory behind it, I'm not really your man. That would have been Professor Horace Lidkins, mad as a box of frogs, of course. But that didn't hold back your career in a place like Oxford. His particular interest was metaphysics and the concept of time. In the mid-30s, he published a paper speculating that time could have physical properties that could be observed and manipulated. He was regarded as somewhat of a harmless eccentric among his academic colleagues. Professor Lidkins briefed me when I first arrived at Oxford. I'll confess I only ever had the haziest notion of what his team was studying. The research lab was located in a secluded wing of one of the colleges. I can't tell you which one it was, as far as I know, that's still classified. What I can tell you is that Lidkins told me he'd selected the site for its gothic arched windows, candlelight-esque lighting and medieval aesthetic. He felt it enhanced chrono-creative thinking. For an afternoon, he bored me senseless trying to impart some knowledge of quantifying temporal frames of reference, modeling the gravitational effects of chronomatter oscillation and quadratic equations predicting access points to past events. My first thoughts were that it was all utter tosh, and Lidkins probably wanted committing. However, my sources in Whitehall told me that Lidkins had connections in high places and that the PM for some reason was inclined to indulge him. It was well known that Winston would occasionally take a gamble on something that could pay off down the line, so who was I to question things too closely? However, any notion I had of enjoying the rest of my war amongst the dreaming spires of Oxford was to be short-lived. General Davidson and the other top brass at MI8 had grown impatient funding background mathematics and wanted practical progress toward operationalizing chronovisibility. I had serious doubts that they'd ever see any return on the money spent. The whole thing was, of course, a ludicrous waste of scarce resources, but I kept my opinions to myself. I was informed that additional lab space had been secured through secret connections in England's textile industry. Arthur Gregson, chairman of West Lancashire Cotton Mills and secretly a scientific advisor to the British Home Office, had made arrangements for Lidkin's team to move into a vacant floor in an otherwise still operating cotton mill in Bolton, some 12 or so miles north of Manchester. 
This site provided over 2,000 square feet of space adjacent to generating machinery that could be adapted to power the time lens gyroscopic prototypes. I was also confidently told that the continual mechanical rattling would also obscure noises from Lidkin's experiments, so the cotton mill workers would be unaware of the secret lab in their midst. MI8 had arranged for a detachment of ten men from one of their special units to be assigned to me. This was led by Sergeant Braithwaite. The detachment would initially help with the move and then perform security duties at the mill. I was told that Braithwaite was a former native of Bolton, so a natural choice. Over the course of a few days, we packed up the majority of the operations in Oxford into a large number of wooden crates and other boxes. The larger pieces of kit were loaded directly onto military lorries and covered with tarpaulin. Braithwaite said that anyone asking questions was to be told it was textile equipment. Apparently, the locals were accustomed to strange cylinders, spools and coils coming and going to the mill. Our small military convoy left Oxford on the 9th of December, heading north towards Bolton. It was a foul night, dark and rainy. As we made slow progress north, I sat in the passenger seat of one of the lorries as Braithwaite drove in silence. My mood was pretty damn low. I feared I'd been handed a poisoned chalice by General Davidson and that the whole thing had every chance of turning into a complete fiasco. We arrived in the early hours of the morning and we were soon at work moving the equipment onto the empty floor in the mill. After just a few days, Lidkins and his team had reassembled their lab and restarted research and development. They had also started to build some bigger machinery that I understood they planned to start testing in a few weeks. I really didn't have a clue as to what the hell most of it was intended to do. The sergeant and the men had been billeted just across the road from the mill in an empty terraced house. It was no doubt cramped with all ten of them in just two rooms. Still, they were good chaps and never complained. As for myself, I had decided that I needed to maintain the separation between officer and men and was lodged a few miles away at Hay Hall. The hall at the centre of a large wooded estate was owned by an old Eton school chum of mine, David Lindsay, the Earl of Crawford and Balcarres. The house had been mostly shut up for the war, so I had the run of the place almost to myself. I spent most of my evenings in the pub at the edge of the estate. We'd acquired a battered staff car, which the sergeant drove up from town each afternoon to brief me on progress. I would accompany him back to the mill two or three times a week to see for myself. One morning in late January, I was working in the library at Hay Hall, when Perkins, Lord Crawford's butler, appeared. He carried a small silver tray containing a message for me that had been taken over the hall's single telephone line. The message was from Lidkins and said they'd made some sort of breakthrough that he wanted me to see at once. He had dispatched Sergeant Braithwaite up to the hall to collect me. I had barely finished taking my morning tea, and I thought it damn impertinent of the man that he was ordering Braithwaite about. As I climbed the stairs to the upper floors of the mill, I could feel a distinct vibration passing through the whole building. There was also a faint electrical hum in the air and the smell of ozone. It was evident that Lidkins and his team had finally fired up his mad endeavour. As I passed through the doors and into the lab, I could see Lidkins' team were manning various stations, oscilloscope screens, amplifier boxes and such lining the walls. The viewing gyroscope of brass and rings was humming like a demented bee. Beneath our feet the floor was quaking and wafts of vapour billowed off overheated machinery. We're peaking the photonic induction field! The quantum flux is at 35%, shouted Lidkins over the din. Sparks flew from the machinery, and acrid smoke wafted as gears spun violently. On a screen on the wall appeared a flickering image. As I peered closer, it steadied and became clear. I studied the man in the image and astonished realized it was Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, head of German military intelligence. He appeared to be in a meeting with some other officers. A great many documents were spread out across a table before them. Lidkins came over and stood at my shoulder. For now, we can only focus between one and four days ago into the past. I hope to improve things soon. It's marvelous, isn't it? It's incredible, I shouted over the noise. He patted me on the shoulder and smiled smugly. He said, you know, no one believed me, not really, but I knew it would work. Go on, test us. 
Where should we focus next? The implications were staggering. The information that could be gleaned might bring the war to a close in months, perhaps even weeks. From my weekly briefings received via MI8 in London, I understood that Hitler was presently believed to be staying at his private residence, the Berghof, at Obersalzberg, near Berchtesgaden. I told Lidkins to focus his equipment on that location. Lidkins scurried off to consult with members of his team. After a few minutes, there was a noticeable increase in the noise from the machinery. The hum, in particular, made my teeth rattle. The floor began to shake ominously. Lidkins gestured to one of his team, who quickly adjusted something. And there pictured was our great nemesis, the Führer himself, apparently taking a bath. For the leader of the master race, he looked somewhat puny. I shook Lidkin's well hand. Old boy. He may have been a pain in the backside, but credit where credit was due. Lidkins and his team had made a huge breakthrough. At the very least, I thought it deserved me sharing a bottle of my Glenlivet whiskey with him. I sent Sergeant Braithwaite out to fetch it and to get a crate of beer for the rest of them. I'd had a serious drink problem ever since I'd returned from the Norwegian campaign, and I freely admit I let things get somewhat out of hand as the night progressed. At some point, someone had gone out for a few more crates of beer, and I'd started on the second bottle of Glenlivet. We drank late into the night. I'm not sure who suggested it, perhaps Lidkins himself, but in the early hours, we decided to fire up his damn machine again. By this time, we were all roaring drunks. It was highly inadvisable, but we did it anyway. You can probably imagine the type of things we focused the machine on. People were shouting out anyone they could think of. If we had a rough location, then Lidkin's drunken team obliged. Vera Lynn in the bath, Marlene Dietrich in her bedroom, FDR in the Oval Office, strange images we got for that one, a George Formby concert, the list grew. People started to shout out addresses they knew. I blurted out my own in London, and shortly there on the screen, I saw my wife Mildred at the door of our house in Belgravia. She was with that bounder, Johnny Hastings, an RAF officer I knew vaguely from my golf club, but more well known to me by his reputation as a cad. Mildred had been behaving somewhat frigid towards me ever since I picked up my embarrassing injury in Norway, but this was beyond the pale. I spent the following morning in bed with an horrendous hangover. I'd no idea how I'd got home. Around noon, I was just about well enough to haul myself out of my bedroom and stagger downstairs in search of a pot of tea. That afternoon, I mulled over my options. It was clear there was only one thing to do. Later that evening, I had Sergeant Braithwaite drive me to the Trinity Street railway station in Bolton. And from there, I took the last train home to London. I had with me my Webley service revolver. I decided rather than go straight home, I would spend the night at my club in Piccadilly. In the morning, I took a cab home from the club. The cabbie was one of those annoying types who never stopped talking. All right, Governor. You'll never guess who I had in the back of the cab last week. I dissuaded any further conversation by taking out my service revolver and tapping on the internal window with it. I said, I've got a very stressful meeting this morning. I'd rather you keep quiet for the rest of the ride or else I may not be responsible for my actions. Funnily enough, he didn't say another word. I quietly let myself in via the front door. From the hallway, I could hear voices that appeared to be coming from the kitchen, and I went to investigate. And there he was, Johnny Hastings, sat bold as brass at my kitchen table with my wife, Mildred. He was eating what appeared to be a full English breakfast. As I'd hardly had the sniff of a real sausage for years due to rationing, I could only surmise that Hastings had obtained it through some devious means. The audacity of the man was staggering. Mildred looked startled and somewhat guilty. Hastings, on the other hand, just looked smug. He speared the sausage with his fork and gestured with it to me. He said, Archie, old man, I'm afraid you've rather caught me out, but there's no need to cause a scene. Why don't you sit down and have a cup of tea? It was the teapot that sealed Hastings' fate. It had been a wedding present from my great-aunt Bertha. I said to Mildred, Darling, can you just step outside for a minute? I'd like a word with Hastings in private. As soon as she'd closed the kitchen door behind her, 
I slowly drew my service revolver. Hastings said, Really, old man, be reasonable. My first shot shattered the teapot. My second took Hastings right between the eyes. He slowly slumped back in his chair and then fell with a thump to the floor. There was surprisingly little mess. I pulled his plate across the table, sat down and continued to finish his breakfast. I wasn't going to let a good sausage go to waste. Mildred had, I hoped, fled the house. I rang HQ from the telephone in the hallway. I said there'd been an incident at my home address and that a clean-up crew would be required. I went back into the kitchen, sat down at the table and calmly awaited my fate. I was detained at what was known as the Glass House at Aldershot. It's long gone now, but at the time it was the army's biggest military prison and housed some 400 to 500 soldiers. All had transgressed military law in one form or another. As an officer, I thankfully had a cell to myself. My court-martial had gone as well as I could guilty have hoped for. I had, of course, pled guilty. The board had accepted my defense that it was a crime of passion, and the judge advocate was surprisingly lenient in sentencing. General Davidson had, I suspect, put in a good years. word for me. My punishment was to spend the next five years confined in the glass house. About three months into my sentence, I had my first visitor. I had no illusion that it would be Mildred. She had informed me by letter that she was returning to live with her mother and would be seeking a divorce. I was led to a small, ill-lit room that was usually used for meetings with prisoners' legal representatives. There sat at a table was Sergeant Braithwaite. I shook his hand and said it was good to see him, but I was somewhat surprised at his visit. He informed me that he was here on behalf of General Davidson. The General felt he may have contributed to my present predicament by forcing me to work with Lidkins and wanted to offer a belated apology. Was a if I served a year or two, he could probably get me placed under house arrest for the remainder of my sentence. I thought it a damn fine gesture, and I said so to Braithwaite. I was also curious how things had progressed in Bolton after my departure. According to Braithwaite, in the week following the breakthrough demonstration, Lidkins had increasingly chased the goal of pushing back the number of days the chronoscope could peer into the past. Things started to go badly. The electrical requirements of the machinery were overwhelming the powerhouse that was adjacent to the mill. There were frequent blackouts that interrupted experimentation. In late February, Lidkins pushed too hard. There was an explosion and fire in the powerhouse. It destroyed the generating equipment and a good part of the powerhouse structure. Fortunately, there were no injuries, but for the foreseeable future, the project was shut down. Braithwaite received fresh orders from General Davidson. A convoy comprising a number of American military trucks and personnel was on its way to the mill. He was to assist them loading all of the project's equipment onto the trucks. The convoy would depart that night for Liverpool docks where a Liberty cargo ship was waiting to load everything. Its destination was New York. No other explanation was given and Braithwaite was too far down the chain of command to question anything. After my imprisonment at the glass house, I had no first-hand knowledge of what had happened to the project other than what Braithwaite told me. I had no reason to disbelieve him. Taking an educated guess, I'd say Winston had traded the whole thing with the Americans for something or other. You must understand that there was an acute shortage of resources at the time. In all probability, the Americans were probably better placed to continue development. Whether they did or not, I couldn't say. Braithwaite said he and his men were on the way overseas. He speculated that General Davidson wanted them out of the way. He was a good chap and would never question an order. They were to become the permanent guard on St. Helena, a British island in the South Atlantic. Apparently, it's one of the most remote islands in the world. I wished him good luck. I was never to see him again. As for Project Chronoscope, well, I've probably told you more than I should. I can hardly believe it myself and I was there. Some things I think are best left forgotten. My understanding is Professor Lidkins followed his project overseas. I believe he died in the States a few years ago now. Mad as a box of frogs, of course. As for me, I was still in the glass house when the war came to an end. As he promised, General Davidson managed to pull some strings and I was released under my own parole towards the end of 1946. I was at a loose end, but an old friend suggested that perhaps I'd like to join him in a business venture. 
Concrete garden gnome manufacture wasn't exciting, but they did sell well. So I can't really complain, I made a damn good living. Well, I do hope I've been of some help to you, Harry. One piece of advice, I'd run your story past MI8 before you publish. I've a contact name if you need one, splendid chap. I knew his father. <laughs>